So, hello everybody, and uh, today we are going to continue our study of the regression. So, let us maybe recap what we know so far already, and where are we going further. So, as we discussed in previous lecture, we already know a linear regression with one parameter. So, basically, the example we are working on in first practical exercise, well, it's zero practical exercise, it's like preparing exercise, yes, is this particular case, which one of groups already is familiar with and another group will have today. Yes, so that is, you try to predict the price of the house based on the area of this house. At this point, you only have one input, x1, and, well, also one output, y. And you make a linear regression as a linear function which tries to predict the price of house based on its size with as small cost function as is possible. So we can visualize this in a sense like a, this kind of a diagram where you have this single input x1. Here you calculate some parameters. You also have, it's not an input, it's like more like bias of one. So here you have a ratio of theta zero, here you have ratio of theta one, and as a result you have the hypothesis h theta of x. So in a sense this is a very simple model of one neuron, yes? So what we are going to do, to do today is to add additional inputs to our problems when we have not only one dependable parameter like area of the house but multiple of them such as let's say age, number of floors, number of bedrooms, etc. etc. So we are going further today by adding uh, accordingly extra parameters like x2 with theta2, x3 with theta3 etc etc so this is what we are going to do today to discuss how are we supposed to add more than one input parameter to our problem and what potential problems we can um, face in that, in that situation because it might seem like an obvious and very easy, easy step however there are certain you know conditions that you must uh, meet before it will actually start working well so, uh, one of the groups had this practical exercise yesterday, another group will have today, so I would like to briefly recap how are we searching for solution. So, we search for solution by updating the gradient, that is partial derivatives, uh, which we calculate here for theta 0 and here for theta 1, and we use this partial derivative to actually improve the theta 0 and theta 1. And we repeat this procedure multiple times, so we iterate over, let's say, 100 times as in our practical exercise, and by 100 iterations we have come to the final solution. Today I will also show you how you can use the um, algebra, basically formula, to find the solution in just one go, yes? So you type in formula, you press enter, it gives you answer, as simple as that. Although we will discuss what are situations when you can use such formula and when such formula use will be difficult. So, uh, now I can see that most of people already are here, so we can go further with our new topic of multi-parameter linear regression model. So now, let's consider that we want to improve our model uh, because not always the price of house depends only on the size of the house. There are multiple other important aspects which may be as important or maybe even more important than the size of the house, yes? Such as number of floors, because you may have one big house with only one floor, or you might have smaller house with two floors, yes? Mm, well, also number of bedrooms, mm, what is the age of the house, yes? Was it renovated or not recently, or maybe what is the 
time in years after the final renovation, yes, which had happened. So we can add a lot, a lot of parameters. So in such condition, we will have multiple inputs parameter problem, which is going to be here, it's x1, here it is x2, here it is x3, here it is x4, we may have even more of them, up to thousands if necessary, yes, but at this particular point let us stop at these x4 parameters, yes. So, uh, the idea remains the same, that means that we we'll also are going to have accordingly multiple theta parameters relevant for this uh, data column. So, theta 1, theta 2, theta 3, theta 4, and that's it. Yes, also theta 0, now it doesn't disappear anywhere, yes, so uh, now we have to search for five unknown parameters instead of two, which really doesn't change the algorithm itself, so it's not that a big deal at this point. However, there is one serious problem with this data. Well, first of all, uh, how are we going to display uh, our result? Because here it is very, very simple. We had x-axis of our size, y-axis of our price. Now, if we would have two inputs and one output, that would still be something you can picture because it is three dimensions, x, y, and z, but what about this case? Now you have literally uh, like five dimensions and we cannot picture something in five dimensions, so there is no way to visualize this solution. You cannot anymore display some kind of line or maybe plane, yes? Now we need to find other ways. So we still can, however, study the data set by trying and displaying the different variations of how output y price depends on each of these parameters individually. Yeah, so the first picture shows our familiar picture, which we already know, the dependence of the price on the area of house. The second picture shows how the price depends on the number of bedrooms, third number of floors, and the fourth on the age. Yes, so we can visualize them separately in any combination we would like to study. So it is still possible to visualize initial data set. The final solution, however, can also be visualized, but again it will be four pictures instead of one. Now this is one of the problems of how are you supposing to imagine or visualize this data, because having multiple dimensions is preventing you from imagining this as a picture in your head, yes? This is not a big issue because it's more like a representation of data rather than calculation of data, but there is one much more significant problem with this data set, consider it how exactly it is calculating. So let me maybe remind you that here we calculate something called a cost function, so j. In this particular case, you will have j for theta 0, theta 1, theta 2, theta 3, and theta 4. It will depend on four parameters. And the formula will be still the same. 1 versus 2m, the summation of the i going from 1 to m. And uh, here we have hypothesis <laughs> minus y. So this is the cost function, it is exactly the same, the only thing that changes is our hypothesis. At this point the hypothesis is going to be, uh, well, I will maybe, ah, I can't, okay, I will type it here, so the hypothesis is going to be of xi theta 0 plus theta 1 x 1 i plus theta 2 x 2 i theta 3 x 3 i plus theta 4 x 4 i. So basically it's the same stuff. The only thing is that now what will happen 
when it tries to minimize this cost function as it should, yeah, so we search still for minimum of this function, different parameters will start having different impact. So it will try to minimize as much as it can this area and will consider that floors are not so important because area is measured in thousands and it affects number, final number of cost function more significantly than floor number. Is it one or two? The cost function almost won't change because of that, yes? So you cannot really see much difference in cost function. Is it two floors or is it one floor? Me making these parameters for this um, optimization problem insignificant, yes? So we might as well even say, okay, I'm going to s throw it away and nothing probably will change in the form as it is now. This happens because of the different scale. Yes, as you can see here, the area is much more important because it is a bigger number. And accordingly, we can visualize this in the form of such intervals. Yes, where the first one here is this size area. Yes, and you can see, okay, where did it go? You can see that it actually can vary in large range and it also has an average value of 2000 and it varies around this value. Now, the number of bedrooms is at this scale barely distinguishable. You cannot really distinguish at this magnitude of thousands. Is it two? Is it three, five? It doesn't really look differently. Even worse is for the number of floors. Is it one or two? So again, the problem here is that this number is, it doesn't matter, is it one or two and at the scale of thousands, yes? Now, the age is measurable in 10, so it can be 10, it can be 20, 30, and is somewhat, a little bit better, distinguishable than other two parameters. So, this means that the cost function will try to minimize mostly, mostly, based on this parameter, and it will somewhat ignore other parameters, which is not what we want. We consider all of these parameters to be equally important, yes, and we want to force algorithms somehow to pay equal attention to each of these parameters. Now, this is a major problem because it can affect your final result, yes? It's not something like you cannot imagine some picture or it may be inconvenient to work with. No, it's actually about the accuracy of your prediction. So we need to solve this problem somehow. The, uh, the solution is actually quite simple, yes? And here you can see uh, how is these different because of this effect. So let's say that theta one parameter, which you can see here, is responsible, this one, x-axis, for the size of the house, which is measurable minimum of zero and maximum of 2,000. Yes, let's say in this range. Now, y-axis will be measured as a number of bedrooms, so with the minimum value of 1 and maximum value of 5. So the scales on this axis are not the same, and this makes this um, area, this data collection, data set, yes, to be stretched, yes, in a sense. And what we would like to have is to have them in the same range, so let's say from 0 to 1 and from 0 to 1. This way, both of these axes will be equally important and the algorithm will not consider some of them not important and will actually try to minimize both of them with the same effort, not like it will try to minimize x1 more than x2. We can achieve that really simply, yes? In this particular case, all that you need to do is to divide by the maximum number what you have and you will force this way the data to be in range from 0 to 1, yes? However, not all data is in such form, so some more advanced normalization is necessary. So we can do this scaling in two ways. First way is normalization, which we already have checked, and it will produce the output in range from 0 to 1. 
So for some problems where we can deal with only positive numbers, this is way to go, uh, which is maybe sometimes more preferred, maybe sometimes less preferred, but at this point what matters most is that all results are going to be positive numbers, yes? Because sometimes some algorithms specifically need that to be. And the calculation is pretty straightforward and easy. You subtract minimum value and then you subtract the mm, deviation, delta, yes, which is equal to max minus mean. Another way of uh, scaling is standardization, yes, when you force your variables to be not exactly but roughly in the range from minus 1 to plus 1, yes. So here we can have both positive and negative outcomes. Here we use statistical parameters such as average, that is mathematical expectation or mean, and the um, variance. Well, it's not exactly variance, it's standard deviation because it is square root of the variance. But this d itself is the variance, and this e of x is the mathematical expectation or let's say mean. So you probably already mentioned these two in the probability theory course, yes? And next practical exercise on probability theory, we'll also try to work with these numbers as well, to evaluate them. But at this point, all that matters for us is so how to calculate them. You calculate expectation, subtract this expectation, so forcing this x dot to be centered around zero, and afterwards you reduce the scale, the deviations from these zero so that it's equal for each of them. So what matters the most is that you have to find expectation for each of them, yes? So you have, let's say, x1 as your first column, x2 as the second column, x3 as the third column. So you need to find expectation of the first column and variance of the first column and apply this formula with these numbers only to the first column. For the second column, you find their own expectation and their own variance. Then you repeat the same procedure for each column individually. So each of these columns is going to have its own version of average and its own version of variance, which is then, according to this formula, is subtracted or normalized with. And as a result, what we are going to get is a much better and smoother picture, yes? So in this particular case, what we did was a standardization, that is, this second method, forcing numbers to be in range from minus one to plus one. And as you can see, this initial data set, which is here, and which had this problem of first column being thousands, second column being like three to five, uh, third column is, that's odd, yes, it should be one, two, I don't know how it came to be 1.5, <laughs> but maybe for somehow there is such attic or something like that, I don't know. Specifically, this is just one or two, and the third column is number like in range from like, I don't know, like 10 to 100, certainly, yes? So, after we apply the standardization method, we can see that all the numbers are more or less on the same scale, which will make them equally important for the algorithm. It will no longer be a problem like it will consider the area be more important than number of floors, because these numbers will now be on the same scale. And here you can see the visualization of all these data sets when you can actually see that all of them are more or less within the range of 1, from minus 1 to plus 1, and with the average value being centered around, yes, is around 0. It's not actually precisely, yes, and hence it can happen that you will have some number, well, like here, for example, actually going to 2, yes, it's almost 2, and some numbers can be almost minus 2, and so on. But uh, more or less, we are within these bounds, and this works for all of these columns equally. So it's much more better than it was before when you had first column in thousands and second column in like one or two, yes? Now, 
we have solved this problem. And afterwards, we are going to solve this task. However, for this, you will need to remember that your theta parameters, your solution now will reflect specifically this new data. So you will search that the parameters for this data set, whereas your original data set was this one. Yes. So you will need, after you have found the hypothesis and when you will want to make a new predictions, to convert your new input data from this format into this format. So that is something you have to keep in mind that you will actually want to keep those average values and those variance values for later on because this is a conversion law which will allow you in future to actually use your model for predicting, yes? Now this is also an important key, key point which we will experiment in practical exercise. Now after this point, uh, literally not really much is different except that your hypothesis has more inputs and more theta parameters as well as the cost function which actually includes this hypothesis. So the calculation procedure is exactly the same and also is the same the update procedure for all theta parameters except now you have to update five of them and you use the same wave formulas like for theta zero you have nothing here yes for theta one you have x one that is first column for theta two you have the second column theta three has the third column theta four has the fourth column and it can go on same way up to thousand million if necessary yes and accordingly uh, it will work just as like that. So this plot shows you how the cost function changes over the iterations. This is something we yesterday actually conducted but we did not visualize this plot yet because it was a little bit tricky for us to achieve so I decided we'll do it next practical exercise but what matters here is that at initial point your cost function was around 1 billion and at the final solution, now it is much, much less, yes. And also here we can see this plateau effect. So one of the ways to understand if your solution is actually good enough or not is to construct this cost function uh, depending on the number of iteration. And then you will be able to visually say, okay, my solution is more or less stabilized because this cost function picture can look differently as well. Let's say somehow like this. Yeah, so you can see that it's still not really stable and potentially it can decrease further. Yes, so that means you need to increase number of iteration from 100 to let's say 200 or 300 to give it more time to find the solution. Or maybe your cost function will look instead, uh, sorry, instead like this. which means it actually cannot find a solution at all, mainly because of your alpha parameter. Yes, that might be to B. So we will study all these experiments in our practical exercise number one, uh, that is first practical exercise with different parameters, and then accordingly you will get a hand on it. So at this point, uh, what will happen if you, let's say I will give you another dat data set of table, and ask you to improve your, uh, well, we can say training practical exercise zero program to actually work with this data set. First of all, you will need to implement this standardization. Yes, this procedure is the first step that you are going to need to change in that program that we've made with one of the groups yesterday and with another group we'll make today. The second stuff will be that you will need to update your hypothesis because now it is going to include this as well. The cost function is going to remain the same because we used hypothesis there, which is already calculated. And also you will need to add extra theta two, theta three, theta four parameters at the, your for loop, yes? Which may be inconvenient, especially if you change data set very often and each of these data sets a different number of columns. So you have constantly to add or remove certain parameters, yes? Now what we want to discuss right now is is there a way to automate this process so that it doesn't matter if your table has one column or one million of this column? It will simply find out itself how many are there and calculate all the theta updates for it 
at the same time, even without our problem of having these old versions, or new versions, like we mentioned yesterday, yes, that will become irrelevant at this point. So for this, we are going to use a vector form of calculating these set of parameters, which is much, much more also faster, yes, and at this point, as you have mentioned, uh, noticed yesterday, it doesn't really matter because your program is executing literally less than in second, yes. But you need to realize that this is just the first step of our neural network and we will have a lot, a lot of such linear regressions in our neural network. In fact, each connection between neurons will be this linear regression in a sense, yes. So there will be a lot of them and having the efficient and fast way of compu computing them will be really necessary because some problems will require half an hour to solve. Yes, half an hour just to get the answer. So uh, how are we supposed to vectorize it then? Uh, for this, you need to have a good understanding of matrix operations, linear algebra, and all that stuff. But don't worry, I will explain relevant part uh, to this algorithm as we go and accordingly that should be sufficient for you. So we have this data set and we want to have this hypothesis. So first of all, uh, like I mentioned here, all of these functions will really are <coughs> somewhat standard, yes? Except this first one. Because here we have theta 1, x1, here we have theta 2, x2, here we have theta 3, x3, here we have theta 4, x4, here we have theta 0, and here we have nothing, yes? So what we are going to do is to artificially introduce here x0, so that this way it will become so that each of these columns is having the same format. However, we cannot simply take any number and add it out of nowhere uh, because this was original for us. So we'll say that all our x0 i is equal to 1, which means we are not going to, you know, uh, disobey any mathematical laws here because multiplying with 1 doesn't change number and it is still some number that we actually added here. So. This is called a bias, which we are adding at this point, yes? And we do so to make it more convenient for us, so that this way all of these actually theta parameters can be then replaced with one single formula as of, I don't know, some theta j equal to theta j. Well, actually, it's not j, it's this. Uh, yes, it is J minus alpha 1 versus M and uh, well, all of this other stuff, yes, so basically H theta X I minus y i multiplied by x j i. At this point, any of these expressions can be replaced by these. So what effectively can happen, that means now you can make a for loop for k. Inside of this for loop, you are going to make a for loop for j and go over from all of them this way. So now you only have one formula and never have to add any more. So effectively, we already solved this problem with uh, variability and universality of our program. Because right now, it doesn't matter anymore for program if you have one column or you have one million column. It will know this from this maximum J value and accordingly uh, calculate all of them. However, this is not an efficient, this is not a fast solution. We still want to, you know, have optimum in a sense both of uh, accuracy and in a sense of computational power. So we are going to go a little bit further. So in order to vectorize the hypothesis, to vectorize cost function and gradient descent, we are going to add this column of bias to our initial data. 
Yes, so here you have this new column, which we simply put ourselves, added as an x0 term, and accordingly all the other columns are the same as they were before. So, then we can actually calculate the hypothesis in a matrix form. So let's take, for example, just one row of this table. Particularly, let's say this one. So, uh, and accordingly, uh, try and calculate this cost function. Yes. Oh, sorry, not cost function, but the hypothesis itself. So what is happening here is now we put these numbers inside. Here we have. Here we have one. Here we had. Uh, can I? No, I think I, I don't know how to do this. Well, some numbers specifically from the first row, which we need to calculate. Now there is a way to actually calculate this. Not like we did yesterday, like when you specify the, in the code, like you have theta zero, theta one, and what if you will need to all write all of them up to theta ten thousand? So you will sit all the day and write them one by one and tell this is zero, this is zero, this is zero, which is not the way to go. So instead. What we are going to do is to say, no, we want uh, to specify theta. Well, I will intentionally mark it like an bold as a vector theta zero, theta one, etc. Theta, I don't know, j consisting of j elements. Well, j is bad letter because we have this for cost function. Let's call this uh, uh, k. Yes? And you can set all of them at to zero with one formula uh, if necessary. Yes? So now we are going to make one variable, one array, consisting of all of these parameters, rather than specifying each of them as a separate variable with its different name. Similarly, we are going to assume that our x data is also one row rather than uh, five different separate numbers. So we take our x data as the row vector, which is already as it is, yes, because in this table this is actually one row, including the bias as well, yes, we don't forget this bias too, as x0, and our theta is a column vector. So what happens now is the matrix multiplication, the matrix product, yes, which is calculated as follows. So you take the element from the first row and the element from the first column here. First from the first from the first row, first from the first column. You multiply them together and get this one. Then you take this second element of the first row, second element of the first column, multiply them together and add them. And so on, so on. So this is how a matrix product is calculated. You take with each element of row with each corresponding element of the column and multiply them together, then add everything together. Of course, this brings you some limitations, mainly that you, if you have five elements here, you really, really have to have five elements also here, because otherwise this operation will not be possible, yes? So, uh, for this step, we don't really bother about it much, because we can say that I want five set of parameters or six set of parameters. It is specifically our own, uh, you know, decision how many set of parameters we want. So, now, instead of calculating the hypothesis like we did in Python programming language, we would write something like h theta is equal as numpy dot between x and theta. 
and that's it. No matter how many columns you have, it will look somehow as simple as this uh, row. Now, uh, well, I'll get a little bit ahead of time here, but what is the best thing is that your table have the second row, which is going to be calculated absolutely in the same way. The third row, the fourth, and so forth. So nothing is really preventing you from taking all of these rows at the same time. Yeah, so here is the first row, second row, third row, fourth row, and finally nth row. And multiplying them with this theta vector. So in this way, you will have all of your input data table multiplied by this vector of theta parameters, added together automatically as well, and calculated all hypothesis points in one go. Yes, so basically this is a matrix form of the solution which allows you to simply type in one uh, command and calculate it with one go. This is convenient because you only need one formula and you don't even care how many columns are there, uh, how many theta parameters you need, because number of theta parameters will be exactly the same as the number of columns. We will actually use Python to check out what is the number of columns. Ah, okay, so then please create me the same number of theta parameters, yes? So it is as simple as that. And what matters even more is that this is actually going to work much faster, yes? Because it has efficient parallelization algorithms, all implemented in C programming language, which makes it run faster, and it can actually even use multiple cores of your processor if you have more, yes? So this way, this can really, really work really fast. And if you use, for example, something like graphical processing units, GPU, which has a lot of smaller, not like cores, but like kernels, yes, capable of calculating each of these multiplication, then this can really go uh, like significantly improve the speed of calculation. Now, there is, of course, other problem that copying data to GPU memory is slow process relative to calculation. So the question is, will it be worth it? But technically, the computation itself is going to be much, much faster. So it can parallelize and make it faster. So this is very convenient for us and very good, especially considering that later on we are going to represent this theta also as a matrix of multiple columns and multiple rows. That is going to be one layer of neural network in future. Yes. So we are slowly, step by step, going in the direction of neural networks with these improvements as well. So now, if we speak about cost function calculation, so what we have discussed right now is only this hypothesis, yes? The same way we can parallelize all the other aspects, like a cost function, the j of theta, and the, uh, well, theta, uh, theta parameters, well, gradient descent method, yes, theta uh, j equals to theta j minus alpha, etc., etc. So this can also be parallelized and specified with one comma. So let's see how we can do that as well. So this is something between mathematics and programming. Yes, what we discuss here right now. So hopefully you are, well, have some knowledge in both of these topics, yes, and uh, I try my best to actually explain this as well. So what we need to do now is to find a way to have the same formula to be calculated in parallel, yes, at the same time for all data uh, with one command for the cost function. So now our cost function is calculating, oh sorry, is calculating the difference between your hypothesis and the real values. Now your hypothesis is a vector and this column, well, the real values is also a vector, the last column of your table. So you can easily subtract them, like a1, a2, a b1, yes, b2, b3, etc. Simply one from another. And in fact, in Python, you won't even have to specify any, I don't know, uh, explicit 
operators for that. You subtract them just like they were just two numbers. So it doesn't matter if these are two matrices or two numbers, the Python will work with them equally. So this difference is not a big deal for us. Now the question comes for this square. Yes, how do we calculate the square of the vector? Well, again, it's not difficult at all. You take this vector. In Python programming language, you specify the power as this double asterisk, type 2, and it's going to take every number of these and calculate the square of that. But this is going to be slow because it's going to process these numbers individually. Yes, we actually can find much better solution to find, and even more so, also this summation can be calculated with, in one go with this square at the same time. So with one hit we can, or with one stone, we can hit two birds, basically we can say yes. How? Well, let's have some very simple example. Consider I have this vector of numbers 1, 2, 3, and 4. And I want to find this answer, yes? Plus 4 square, which is 16, 9, that is 25, and 4, 29, 30. Yes? So how can I parallelize this stuff and calculate this in a matrix form efficiently without having to calculate this separately, this separately, this separately, this separately, and then having to add them together manually? Yes? Well, I can actually say I want to have a matrix product of... Uh, let's make it... I need some more space here. 1, 2, 3, and 4 between these two matrices. So now it's going to take the first element from here and the first element from here, multiply them, second from here, second from here, multiply them, add together, third and third, add together, fourth and fourth, add together. And it's going to give you answer 30. And it's going to use a matrix product for doing that. So what that means for us is that what we need to do here is to have this vector multiplied by its transpose. So because in a sense this is the transpose of 1, 2, 3 and 4. Yes? And that is it. So we take our hypothesis vector. Well, it's going probably to be a column, so actually the hypothesis vector is here, and the hypothesis transpose is going to be here, yes? So, we multiply them, and we get this entire thing calculating. All that is left is to actually divide by 2m, and that is it. So, in a short matrix form, then this can be calculated as follows, yes? So. Uh, it is very simple, not really difficult, and actually much shorter code as well, uh, which will be easier to read, and it will work faster. So there are only positive benefits to us uh, with the small price of having more knowledge about algebra, about matrices, and understanding how this can be put together. But this is exactly why we study this course, yes? This is exactly to learn this stuff. And once you have found this out, you can actually uh, use the same approach any time you want to calculate some, let's say, mean squared error, or maybe variance, or maybe some other uh, similar problems. Yes, it can actually make it work faster and more efficient. So we have calculated now the cost function as well in this parallelized form, which is, which is just one formula. Now we are going to go and solve the same problem for our gradient update method, yes? So mainly this list of the possible formulas which is including here this bias, we have introduced x0, i, uh, making them all the same and actually the final formula that is going to calculate all of them at the same time, so all of them will be calculated with just one of these formula. 
Yes. So what we have here is very similar approach, except that now you need to calculate this difference multiplication not with itself, but with the other column of your data. So previously, you needed to calculate your h theta x i minus y i uh, transpose uh, with itself in previous slide uh, x i minus y i. Now, however, we need not the square anymore, but to multiply with the, another column of data. So basically, we simply say, okay, we are going to replace the second multiplier with our x column. Yes. So we put there instead, well, I will write x like this then. So to be distinguishable, this is multiplication of matrix and this is x, yes. And here I will also make it this way. Xi with the column number j. So this way we can now accordingly calculate this in a vector form. And nothing is actually preventing you from running the same formula at the same time for all of this theta, just for theta 0, theta 1, theta 2, and etc. Cetera, et cetera. So this will actually, in expanded form, uh, expanded form, look like what we have here on the right, yes? So here is your uh, first column, here is your second column, here is your third column, fourth column, fifth column, yes? And accordingly, the first column is going to go and calculate theta 0, the second column is going to be responsible for theta 1, the third column is going for theta 3, the fourth column for theta, or theta 2, theta 3, and the fifth column for theta 4, yes? So basically, this again works as a matrix product and allows you to calculate with just one formula, yes? And this is expanded well, not really expanded, but shorter version, when we specifically say this is column 0, column 1, column 2, column 3, and column 4. If you put them together, you mark this by this bold font of x, yes, uh, to denote that now x is actually a matrix, yes. So all of these digits now, all of the symbols are now in bold, meaning that this is matrix, this is matrix, well, vector, but still vector is also considered a one-dimensional matrix, X is matrix, hypothesis is matrix, alpha is not bold, yes, it's just a regular form, so it's not a matrix, it's just one number, just like number M, and theta is also a vector, yes, so that is a one-dimensional matrix. So putting all of that together allows you to calculate the hypothesis, the cost function, and the gradient updates in a matrix form much faster and with much shorter code which, however, will require uh, understanding of what happens there from mathematical points of view. So now I know that you will discuss uh, in probability theory uh, this uh, linear regression uh, topic as well. Just wanted to uh, point out that not any problem can be solved by using linear regression. So there are certain conditions which problem must meet before you can actually consider that you can try and use this method. So let's try and see what are these assumptions and these conditions. Yes, well, first of all, if we speak about specifically a linear regression, then the dependence between input and output should be a really a linear function. So here you can see example of linear function to the left and example of non-linear function to the right. Yes, clearly the right picture shows you some more like quadratic pattern which is in this particular case showing how does change consumption of the car, fuel, car engine for fuel depending on how heavy is the car, on the weight of the car, yes? So this is actually a quadratic function and it is not a linear regression. 
Don't worry, however, we will find a way to use our knowledge of linear regression to solve this kind of problem. In fact, I used this and treated this as a linear problem with a small modifications to the original data. So I changed some data so that after my modifications to data, this became a linear problem. I will show this more a little bit later today. But uh, at this point, this is really important, that the problem itself has to be linear for you to use a linear regression model. Otherwise, you need to use non-linear regression model, which is, again, completely fine. Second important moment is that it should be independent. Yes, so independent meaning that your... Uh, well, specifically, we are speaking about errors, yes? So what I mean by that is Okay, let's return to some of our data set to table. Let's say here now we make some predictions. Yes, uh, let's say we have predicted 450, we have predicted 231, we have predicted 310, or maybe like 316, okay. And then we calculate the error of prediction as the difference between these two. So the error here is 10, the error here is 1, the error here is minus one, etc., etc. So these errors need to be independent, meaning that this one in no way should be dependent on whether previous was 10 or something else. Again, this, at this point, this seems to be like fair and square because it is actually a linear problem and <laughs> it is true. However, in some problems, there might happen so that error will actually affect next predictions. Yes, yeah? so if you make if you have inaccurate prediction at the beginning, your next predictions are going to become even more inaccurate because of accumulating this error. So this is called a correlation process, yes? And accordingly, it needs to be not there. So basically, this is not something with which we can work, yes? So here you can see output of the error of uncorrelated random numbers, which are uh, scattered in much wider area and for correlated numbers here you can see that they are actually concentrated around certain uh, pattern yes so this is like so yes again we'll speak about correlation in our probability theory course what exactly it is how we evaluate that but at this point it's really important that this correlation in the error of predictions should not be there otherwise it cannot be a linear problem now, another assumption is that these errors should have a constant variance. Like, here you can see these errors basically distributed around this area more or less evenly. There are no certain like areas where the concentration is higher here and the concentration is not so high anymore here, yes? So again, this goes to the error. And most of these conditions specifically show to error. So this is the way for you to find out if actually you can or cannot use the linear regression for this kind of problem. You make a prediction, you make the model, and then check what is the error. Is it correlated? Does it have constant variance or not? And so on. And also a probability distribution function of the error prediction. Yes, so for a linear problem, it should be a normal probability distribution, the Gauss law, yes, and as for the nonlinear problems, it will be something different, not exactly Gaussian <coughs> process, yes, here you can see it's not symmetric as it should be for a Gaussian process. So this is some small notes to note how you can verify whether you could use linear regression for this kind of problem or could not. Now, in the remaining time, let us also consider the problems of non-linear case. So, what happens if your problem is not linear and you still need to make some kind of predictions, like here? Clearly, I already have shown you that this is more of a quadratic problem, like so, right? And it defines how much fuel does your car consume based on its weight? So here you have weight, here you have fuel consumption in... Well, basically it's not exactly fuel consumption, it says how far it can go on your 
one gallon, but they are relevant, yes? Again, if it consumes more, it can drive less distance. So it's, in a sense, it's a reverse of the fuel consumption, yes? Uh, so, uh, accordingly, what we want to try to do is to try to predict it. We can, of course, calculate the linear regression problem, yes, just like we did before, but it will not be actually the best solution because here you can see a lot of points are concentrated around this line and below. Here we have a lot of points going up, here a lot of points down, and here almost nothing, yes, so it's not really mm, targeting in the best way, all these points as it should be. Yes. Again, we can use uh, scaling to reduce these numbers because these are quite large, yes, and we may want to reduce them, but it's not really necessary for this kind of a problem when you have only one input. Yes, only one input, it's not a big deal to have it uh, scaled. But if you want to make it uh, faster, yes, because computer will have easier time to calculate these smaller numbers rather than having to calculate huge numbers, because your cost function also will become in trillions, billions, and so forth, which are larger numbers and accordingly require more memory. Maybe it is going to force computer to switch to certain arithmetics, yes, and accordingly make it slow, yes. Again, this goes directly with computers, their processor, their instruction sets, and all that stuff. Sufficient to say that floating point numbers are more convenient for computer to work with, yes? So we can consider scaling just because of that reason alone, even if we don't really have to in this case. However, I did scale this with one purpose in my mind, because what I want to have is actually uh, this kind of a problem having x square, so that I can construct this quadratic function. And actually nothing, there is literally nothing preventing me from doing this myself. Yes, so what I do, I say, okay, I am going to add a new column to my table, which will be weight square. Yes, so here you can see that I have calculated squares of this first column, and created a second column. So basically this column is the squares of this column. I did this just myself. And now from the perspective of the weight squared, this problem is now a linear problem. Yes, because squares are already taken care of and we have some linear uh, formula. This is actually very similar to our first problem. So let's go back here and here. We consider this as an area of the house, but you can imagine that actually you can always consider this area of the house or area of the land around it as two parameters, like height and width. Or height and width. Or length and width, maybe like this. It's not actually height, it's actually this is length and this is uh, width, yes? So in that sense, you can always calculate area by multiplying these two numbers, L multiplied by width. And here we only take the final answer. But what if you were actually considering to split this area into two parameters? In that case, your hypothesis would look like somehow uh, like this, yes? So it will have mm, theta zero, plus theta 1 multiplied by x1 multiplied by x2, which again is a non-linear regression problem. So what it means is that you can sometimes, if you understand how, convert non-linear problem into a linear problem. And this example with a fuel consumption for engine is exactly like so, yes? We created a linear problem from non-linear simply by calculating the squares ourselves. And this is also why I did calculate this uh, standardization now, because I have the squares in addition to original values, you can see the difference. This is having four digits, this is having eight digits, yes? And obviously the cost function is going to have some problems trying to equalize importance of these parameters. If you consider the second column to be much, much more important because these numbers are huge and are going to give a large penalty, 
to cost function simply by by being there, yes? Uh, and it will try to reduce effect of these large numbers as much as it can. Maybe sometimes even, you know, uh, on the effect of smaller numbers. So to avoid this problem, we actually standardize this by scaling and forcing all of them to be in range from zero to one. In this way, there are no longer such large difference and can be considered together. Yes? Now our hypothesis has two input columns and a bias. Yes, we also have this bias, uh, which is x0 here, column of ones. Now you always add this column of ones after you have performed scaling, because if you try to perform scaling for this column of ones, it will convert to column of zeros and will effectively cancel out this term, which is not what we want. Because, well, variation here is none, there is no variation whatsoever in this column, and the average is one. If you subtract average, you get zero and divide by the uh, variance of zero and get, well, actually it's going to be undefined number, yes? So, first you do scaling, then you add the column of ones. And from this perspective, now you can say that this is our x1, this is our x2. We, of course, know that x2 is x1 squared, but at this point it doesn't matter for us. All that it matters is that this is another column which we treat as if they were not related, yes? So we put them simply into our problem, uh, linear regression with multiple parameters, and accordingly end up having the solution which we care to get, having a non-linear function. As you can see, this is not a straight line. This is actually a quadratic function, as it should be because of this x square. And we used a linear regression method to calculate that non-linear problem. This is somewhat cheating, I consider, but at any rate, we can verify that this is actually more accurate solution by estimating cost function. So for linear function, the cost function was 9.39, and for quadratic function, it was 8.68, which is smaller number, and hence the second formula is more accurate at describing this data set. Yes, so it is really as simple as that. And the final topic today would be how can we calculate the same problem without having to go through this gradient descent procedure? Yes, without having to repeat uh, like 100, 200 or 300, it does depend on your problem, times all these equations and improving your accuracy with each next step. So basically what I want to say is how are you supposed to, instead of this picture, get something like here you have only one iteration and a minimum cost function in just one go. Yes, just make calculation once and have the best solution. Actually, is even going to be more accurate than here. Now, this is a set of normal equations, yes, which we can calculate again in a matrix form. So again, linear algebra and matrices are your friend here. And as you can see, there exists an analytical solution which says all that you need to do is to know your x data, your y data, which we happen to do. This is our table of, in, of data set, yes, the columns of inputs and the column of output. And you can have theta parameters by simply calculating this one expression just once, yes? Now, you don't even have to do normalizing although it can speed up process if you work with smaller numbers with floating points it's not really necessary for this to work because we don't have a cost function here anymore like we did in gradient descent and hence it's not going to consider that some parameters are more important some parameters are less important all of these parameters are equally important and used in this calculation yes now there is however somewhat a trick to make this work you always have to find something called inverse matrix, yes? Inverse matrix is such a kind of a matrix which multiplied by your matrix produces the identity matrix. And there exist certain conditions 
when this inverse matrix can exist and it cannot. So, as you imagine, not for any data set you have, this inverse matrix will exist. Actually, inverse matrix exists only if it is as taken from the square matrix, meaning that your number of rows and number of columns should be the same, which is often not the case. Let's consider, for example, our data set about houses. Yes, you had like around 150 rows and just one column, which is not a square matrix. So we cannot use this uh, kind of solution for directly for this kind of problem. But don't despair, there actually is a way for us to convert this matrix into square matrix, yes? So how are we supposed to do? Well, normally our output, our hypothesis in a sense, yes, in a vector form can be calculated as this matrix product of your input matrix multiplied by theta coefficients. Now, in order to have x inverse, to express this at a zero, yes, because what we are going to say is that if we were to have this x inverse, then all that you would have to do is to multiply both sides of this expression minus one x and theta. This will effectively produce identity matrix, cancel each out each other out, and will review leave you with the answer like theta is equal to this. Yes, so basically what we want is this. The direct formula, the direct answer theta is calculated like so. But, as I mentioned, this inverse matrix might not exist, and it will not exist, if it's not originally square matrix X, which will, in most cases, will never be. So we'll go it a little bit longer way and force it to become a square matrix by using this procedure. So what happens here? Let's maybe take a small numerical example to demonstrate what is happening here. So let's consider that you have um, a vector 1, 2, 3, and you want to create, convert that vector into 3 by 3 matrix somehow. So this is actually a way to go. Normally, when we wanted to calculate the sum of the squares, we were doing it this way, yes? Vector row multiplied by vector column. However, in matrix algebra, you probably already didn't know this, but I'm going to point it out anyway, that the order of multiplication actually matters. So that means that calculating this product is going to be nine, uh, nine four, one, that is uh, 14, and calculating it like so, 1, 2, 3, multiplied by 1, 2, 3, is going to be somewhat, somewhat completely different. So let's find out what exactly it's going to be. In fact, it's going to be a square matrix, with the first element being 1 multiplied by 1, second element being 1 multiplied by 2, and so forth. Second row is going to be 2, 4, and 6, and the final row is going to be 3, 6, and 9. So we have created a square matrix, yes? And it doesn't matter what was your X matrix originally, it's always going to produce X matrix. So in order to compensate for that, we also multiplied Y on the second part of the expression with the same matrix. Also, pay attention that it matters order. So you multiply from the uh, left part, yes? Not, not like this. No, you specifically want it to be before your x. Now, we can calculate that, no problem. We have our data matrix x and we can transpose it and multiply. This is not something we can do, which is fine. Now, however, we are guaranteed that this is a square matrix, so the inverse should always exist, yes? Again, this square matrix is not the only condition of the inverse, so even for a square matrix it can sometimes not exist, but it's again not a big problem because in Python we have co something called a pseudo-inverse, which will exist always. It may, may not be exactly the same as the actual 
accurate inverse because it's calculated numerically, but uh, it is going to be accurate enough, enough for us to use it to find the solution. So what we are going to do now is to say, okay, now that I have this, I want to have inverse of this multiplied for both sides, both here and both here. So you end up with this part here and this part here. Now, as I said, inverse matrix multiplied by matrix itself is going to produce identity matrix of some sort of this. And identity matrix is, in a sense, the same stuff as uh, one in our regular algebra. When you calculate something, multiply by one and nothing changes. So identity matrix multiplied by this theta will still be theta. Meaning all of this stuff goes away and we are left with this final solution, which is here, yes? Which you can input in the computer, press enter, and it will calculate. No need to iterate, no need to repeat process at any time, and it will be actually the absolutely accurate answer, the best precision you can ever get. So if you will try to compare your gradient descent method, uh, you will probably depending on how many points after, how many decimal points you will consider, yes, you will notice some difference. And in this comparison, this will be always more accurate than the gradient descent. However, you will also notice that the gradient descent is good enough for us not to really care about this accuracy. So the question would be then, why do we even need this gradient descent method, which requires multiple iteration, which requires you to guess alpha parameter learning rate, and so on and so on. When normal equation, as I said, does not need any alpha, no need, which works in a single run without having to repeat the process, and so on. Well, the problem is that of this stuff, yes, which you need for being able to calculate uh, the inverse matrix. And its computational complexity, this is something you learn in computer science courses, yes, but in a sense, this shows you how the algorithm is depending on the number of inputs. So n, in this particular case, is number of inputs, how many uh, entries in your data table you have, and O shows you, let's say, for example, how many memory space you are going to need to collect all of that. And for this particular calculation, you are going to need third degree of your input, meaning if you have one million of inputs, a lot, yes, then here you will need one million of the power of three space for memory which is going to, first of all, require this space of memory, which technically should still be probably solvable if you make some server with a lot of memory, but that's not only the problem. The other problem would be that the size of your matrix is also going to be huge. Yes, actually million by million. So uh, it will also work slowly, yes? Whereas compared to these gradient descent will have a complexity of just n, yes? Meaning that if you have a lot of data, normal equations can have technical issues with that and require a lot of memory and time to compute it. If you have not large amount of data, you can safely use these normal equations for linear regression problems, yes? And the gradient descent can produce the same answer, but depending on how much data you have, it may be slower, it may be faster. And of course, you will still have to find appropriate alpha parameter for your specific problem. Because, well, in our practical exercise, I was kind enough to tell you, here I have figured it out, let's use this alpha, because I already know it and I can share it with you. But let's say I will give you some other data set which I do not know alpha for. I will say, sorry, I don't know what is your alpha. You have to try different alphas and find out which is better. Now, here we don't need that. So considering all that together, you need to always 
decide what, which of these methods will be faster or easier for you to achieve. Yes? But again, this will only be an issue for a linear regression problems. Yes? Next lecture, we'll start speaking about logistic regression. And you will no longer have this equation as an option anymore. So there will be only gradient descent method for you to consider and nothing else. Well, not only gradient descent, other similar algorithms, but what I mean, there will be no such mathematical accurate solution. And for neural networks, same situation, definitely no existing solutions to find any neural network for your specific problem, yes? So, putting all that together, now you know how you can use linear regression methods, and even non-linear, yes, because here it's not really necessarily that you can always calculate the square. You can use any kind of function you'd like to, let's say e power of x, or maybe harmonic function sin x, or any other. You simply reshape your data set to suit better the law of regression and accordingly apply the same linear regression for this modified data set. So you change data set and use the same method, yes? Instead of trying to find other method. With all that in mind, we will try this in practical exercises to come, but uh, <coughs> next lecture we'll start speaking about classification. So if there are any questions, don't hesitate to ask me. The second group today will, well, I don't know, second or first, other group will have today practical exercise after this class, yes, where we will start all this stuff too. Thank you for attention.